Thank you. Uh, thanks, Bernice, for a nice introduction. Uh, it's my honor and pleasure to visit Xuan and to meet some old friends. And I find there are lots of uh, colleagues there. They're from uh, University of Hong Kong. And I, I had worked there for four years. And also, I'm also glad to meet new friends like you. So I hope in this evening, um, I'm going to share um, a, as a very introductory uh, seminar in uh, meta-analysis. And then in the coming one, we'll, I will talk a little bit on structural equation model. So. Um, Bernard has already introduced what I'm doing, but I've already prepared uh, two slides, so I quickly go through it. So um, basically, uh, I'm a quantitative person, meaning that uh, I rarely do any substantive research. Uh, I'm more interested in numbers, how to work with numbers, how to do data analysis correctly. And uh, my, my primary uh, yeah, um, uh, my primary affiliation is Department of Psychology, but also have a Courtesy appointment in management organization. So, um, and uh, in terms of research techniques, I'm more interested in multivariate techniques, including missing how to handle missing data, multi-level model data. Because nowadays, all of these issues are twisted together. So, you you can't just focus on one of them. You need to handle them from a more holistic approach. And uh, I'm also, uh, in the past few years, I'm also more involved in editing, uh, reviewing. So, uh, so currently, I'm a source editor of three journals, also uh, in a few editorial boards. Uh, so they, they use a lot. I mean, in terms of time, it's quite uh, extensive in terms of reviewing uh, papers. But also, they give me a very good opportunity to look at, uh, let's say, what are the issues, what are the what uh what others are doing so it's a good opportunity for me to learn from them okay so let's go back and talk about today so in this workshop uh or in this talk i'm going to introduce systematic review and meta-analysis so the idea is to give you an overview uh, what systematic review is and what meta-analysis is and don't worry there'll be no equation at all so uh so uh, I pre when I prepared, I, I tried to pitch it at a more introductory, more overview, more conceptual level. So hopefully you won't fall asleep uh, in the afternoon after, after lunch. So, um, so my motivation was to give you an overview. So if you are interested and find the techniques useful, so please uh, try to do more homework. Okay, so um, by the way, basically, uh, I learned meta-analysis by self-learning. So my former supervisors, his um, primary research is in the area of structural equation modeling. So I was trained under structural equation model. But at my graduate school, I also find interesting to work with meta-analysis. So I did all of these learning readings. So nowadays, there are lots of resources. Uh, online from textbooks from journal articles so uh, for this younger generation I think you have plenty of energy to learn and master new techniques so don't worry about the details I, I think I'm quite sure that you have plenty of time and energy as long as you have the motivation to do it then you shouldn't have any problem and I have to stress that uh, although I'm focusing on the introduction uh, it, I'm afraid we cannot be an expert in just two hours or in fact one and a half hours. Okay, so don't don't set your expectation too high. Okay. So first of all, why do we want to consider meta-analysis or or systematic review? So it's from a more basic uh, uh, approach is from the so-called evidence-based movement. So um in many disciplines when we are when we are talking about the effectiveness of treatment, therapy, drugs, then we would like to talk about whether the drugs or the interventions are useful, they, whether they benefit the patients, the participants. So the, it's quite obvious that all of these are related to evidence. But as we are going to see, there are different levels of evidence. Some of them are more uh, inf informal, while others um, are based on evidence. Okay, so um, there are various evidence as indicated here. We can just based on observations, 
For example, uh, you may meet a few friends, a few colleagues, and based on the discussion, then you may find, uh, well, they find this drug is useful. Okay. But this is based on personal opinion. So it is also part of the evidence, but uh, if you are talking about life or death, you may not want to put off your evidence or say just based on someone's opinion. So, but let me put it this way, that's also part of the evidence, but it may not be the strongest evidence. And there are also qualitative research, uh, so it also provides evidence for some researchers may uh, look at uh, existing data, doing review, and then they can summarize some findings. So there are also evidence. So when we are talking about evidence, it's not just a yes or no, whether there's evidence or there's no evidence. Usually it is a continuum. It depends on the strength of the evidence. And in uh, other design, um, there are also single case experiments. For example, we only have one subject uh, because we just want to follow uh, them over a period of time, and then we just look at whether there are any effects. That's also a reasonable design, given the limited resources. And a more formal one is like interventions or randomized control trials in clinic uh, code settings. And I have to highlight meta-analysis because across lots of disciplines, meta-analysis usually is considered as the highest levels or the best way when we are talking about evidence. So um, this is a hierarchy of evidence which was proposed in med, uh, medicine. So from their perspectives, um, the highest level, as we can see, is uh, on the top is the systematic reviews, meta-analysis. At the bottom, it is case studies or case reports. Okay. So in other words, when we are talking about how good the evidence is, for example, if we are going to make a judgment whether this uh, drug or intervention is useful or not, we can go through from the, base, the lowest level to the highest levels, depending on whether there are data or evidence available. So let's consider a case if there's only one study, then there's no way to consider meta-analysis because the best or the available evidence is just based on one study. But if there are better evidence, then I think as a reasonable, logical person, uh, I would like to make my decision based on the best evidence. So in medical research, um, probably you know it or not, nowadays when they make decisions about uh, drugs or interventions, basically they rely on uh, meta-analysis, um, systematic review rather than a single studies. The major reason is what we know is uh, there are lots of limitations in primary studies. I'm quite sure that you have conducted some projects before. At the end of the discussion, what's the session limitations? Usually we have to include uh, the limitations of your own design, the samples, the participants, or even something happens during the data collection. So these limitations may affect how good the, this, the paper is. Okay. So for a single study, we can't even make a very strong case even because of the limitations. So how can we make decisions just based on one or two studies? So now suppose there's not a single study, you have 10 studies. Based on the literature, you can ex extract 10 studies. Then a logical approach is to summarize all of these 10 studies and make a general conclusion. So if the conclusion tells us that the, the intervention or this counseling approach work, then we trust the findings because they provide strong evidence. They are based on 10 studies instead of one. So this is the whole idea of meta-analysis. Meta-analysis is not something totally new. In the past, if, even in science, in physics, they also had to summarize different uh, findings from different labs. For example, they, uh, in the old days, when they measure the speed of light, then different lab may report different speeds of light. Even though we know speed of light is a physical constant, but from a me measurement perspective, it's not always as correct or exact as the, the values. So in order to get a better estimate, they have to combine these estimates from all labs. So this was the basic or the uh, old ideas of meta-analysis. So that's, it's quite intuitive for us. We are trying to summarize existing findings. 
So we need to talk a little bit about two slightly similar but not identical concepts. One is systematic reviews. The other is meta-analysis. For systematic review, the idea is try to make sure that when we are looking at the literature, we, we try to minimize the bias. Okay. I'm quite sure that all of us have done systematic review before, es especially if you have conducted primary research, because we need to write the introductions. Okay. So in the introduction sessions, if you have done a research project before, then we need to write introduction. In the introduction, we have to ha uh, outline what has been done, what are the issues. So these issues may lead to your research hypothesis and research question. And the idea of systematic review basically is the same as the literature review. But we need to ensure that for, for this process, we need to provide a clear guidelines on how to read uh, these numbers or these studies. For example, you can't just say, well, based on my friends, he gave me five studies on the effectiveness of these drugs. So this is not a valid approach because no one can replicate your findings because your friends are not my friends. So I, I can't ask my friends to give me some studies. So nowadays we, we use computer search to help us to locate the studies. By using the appropriate keywords, we need to highlight what are the keywords we would like to do the searching. And then we need to include what we call the inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria. For example, if you are doing a systematic review on the effectiveness of therapy, then you may just want to focus on experiments or interventions. You don't want to include observational studies. So we need to include and indicate clearly how to come up with the literature review, so to speak, so that others can replicate from the computers. If I have the computers, if I have the database, then I can come up with the same set of studies because these sets of studies will be used as the inputs in the further steps for meta-analysis. If, the, if there are some problems on the input, then the outcomes, the output will be misleading. That's why we, the idea of a systematic review is to ensure that in the, when we do the searching, uh, we are, it is free of bias. We try to ensure that everyone will come up with the same set of data. So in the literature, um, there are two interesting and important societies, and all of them are related to systematic review and meta-analysis. The oldest one uh, is the Cochrane Collaborations. So um, this society um, was founded in order to address the question of how effectiveness uh, the drugs or intervention are. So basically, they are focusing on medical science. So simply speaking, this society keeps track of lots of uh, meta-analysis database and protocols, and they provide uh, best standards when we are doing meta-analysis in medical science. Okay. But for us, I think many of us are from the social sciences discipline, then we need a slightly different set of protocols or techniques. Then there's another one, uh, Campbell Collaboration. So for this society, it focuses on uh, policy, education, and social sciences. So how this society um, affecting us, they provide the guidelines on how to do the systematic review, how to do the meta-analysis, and how to report the findings. And more importantly, in these societies, they have data bases on lots of published meta-analysis. So suppose if you are interested in finding, let's say, the effectiveness of a small class effect. Okay, so you'd like to see whether um, if we implement small class teaching, whether it is effective or not. When we go to the database, probably there will be some studies or meta-analysis re related to these topics. So this helps us to, uh, even though you may not be a researcher, but it helps us to implement the procedure or to see whether there are available evidence on, on the policy that you'd like to implement. So as um, I've already mentioned before, systematic review attempts to minimize the biases in all the searching processes. But uh, after doing the searching, the outcome basically is uh, some studies, let's say 20 studies, 40 studies. But sometimes it may not be good enough 
because uh, we like to quantify these studies. So by the way, in social sciences or in science in general, uh, one key uh, important assumption or, or approach is we need to quantify the effects. We don't want to use a qualitat qualitative approach. Let's say this is effective, this is not effective. We would like to quantify the magnitude of effect. So this is the foundation of science because when we are talking about uh, psychological attributes, effectiveness, we would like to quantify everything. So that's why in physics, the first thing we need is how to do measurement. So what it means is even we have studies, we can, even we can tell for some studies, it shows that uh, this therapy is useful, but other studies may show that the therapy is not useful. So how can we quantify the effects? This is the main idea of meta-analysis. So systematic review helps us to allocate and find the studies. And then for meta-analysis, it provides a statistical model to summarize the effect sizes and conduct uh, more, what we call statistical modeling. For meta-analysis, uh, when we are um, talking about or referring to meta-analysis, we can refer it as the techniques or we can refer it as a combination of both systematic review and meta-analysis because usually for meta-analysis, it already includes systematic review. Okay. Um, in general, for meta-analysis, uh, there are a couple of objectives. The first one is try to address and see whether there's a general effect. Okay. Just like layman's, researchers also want to ask the general question whether the, um, this therapy is effective or not. So this looks like a very simple question. We just want to see whether as a whole there's an effect. So we are focusing on a, what we call point estimate. We would like to see, let's say, across 20, 30 or 40 studies as a whole, whether the treatment is effective. So we are asking for a single number. Okay, so it looks like it's simple. We are asking for a single number, but uh, the techniques behind is not that straightforward. That's why there are lots of textbooks, uh, papers and formulas or meta-analysis, they try to come up with a better estimate of these single est numbers. But you can imagine a single number may not be good enough. Sometimes it could be misleading. Imagine if I tell you that the, this treatment, this therapy, for example, I'm, uh, I'm inventing a new therapy uh, technique, and I found that um, the effect is, uh, let's say, 0.5. Uh, no matter what 0.5 means. So positive means it's better. Zero means it is not effective. Negative values means it is even harmful. If I tell you that it is 0.5, then it looks good because on average, the therapy is better than nothing. Okay. But if you are careful, then you ask the next question. How homogeneous the findings is? Let's say if all the studies or all the effects are homo very similar, all the studies are around 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.4, 0 0.6. Then we are quite comfortable that if we are applying the same techniques, this new therapy to a new uh, group, then we expect something around 0 0.5. But if the study is very, very heterogeneous, for some studies, it could be one, but for other studies, it could be zero or even negative 0.5. So there's a very wide spread of effect. We call in the context of meta-analysis, we call this heterogeneous. The effect sizes are very heterogeneous. Then the implication is when we are using the mean, the point estimate, we need to be very, very careful because we are referring to the average studies, average person. It may not be applicable to all. So um, the idea of heterogeneity is uh, important concept in meta-analysis, especially when we are going to apply the results, the effects on, in a practical uh, case. Because we don't want to come up with the case that on average it is effective, but the treatment or intervention can be harmful to some participants okay, because of the heterogeneity. Okay. The, so in order to address this, we want to estimate the heterogeneity. Um, probably uh, 
you think it is quite complicated, we need to estimate the effect and also its heterogeneity. But the idea is very, very simple. Probably all of you, uh, you have already known the concept. If we, are going, if we are talking about the average effect, in fact, we are using the mean, something similar to the mean of the effect size. So how about the heterogeneity? Then variance. So in basic, in the first lecture of statistics, we have to learn the mean and the variance. So these uh, parameters quantify the basic idea of meta-analysis. So, so after conducting a meta-analysis, you expect they will report the mean F effect and also its variance. Okay. So this will summarize or tell us whether when we apply the same uh, intervention or method or techniques to another population or studies, whether the effect will vary a lot. If the heterogeneity is small, then we can trust the findings because we expect it will be very, very similar. But on the other hand, if there's a large degree of heterogeneity, then we need to be careful because the mean would be misleading. Then the next question is, how about if there's a large degree of heterogeneity? Can we explain why some studies would be very, very useful or effective, while the other groups of studies can, may not be very effective or sometimes even be harmful? So the same ideas applies to meta-analysis. We try to find some moderators, uh, like study characteristics, uh, samples characteristics, and then try to predict it. We have also learned similar techniques, which is regression. Okay. So we applied similar techniques. Of course, we need to do some modif modification, but the ideas are exactly the same. So we try to find some studies characteristic, like uh, when we are talking about intervention, one obvious potential moderator is, is the duration of intervention. For some interventions, they they may just implement a four-week sections, while others, they may eight week. So this duration may ex partially explain the effect. So we can conduct similar things. So this is the whole or basic idea of meta-analysis. Now when we come back to the question, it looks like when we are doing meta-analysis, in fact, we, there are two steps. The first step is systematic review. The second step is meta-analysis. Usually they are almost interchangeable and it's also up to us sometimes when you read papers, they may term me as we, are, we have conducted a systematic review and a meta-analysis. But for other researchers, they may just indicate that they have conducted a meta-analysis because uh, they have already assumed uh, there's a systematic review component. But these two processes are slightly different and sometimes we may not need them or we can't conduct or report both of them in the same paper. For example, after conducting a systematic review, it may turn out that the studies are too messy. They're too different. And there's, uh, there's no point to average or combine them. Because as we have mentioned, for, met to, for a meta-analysis, we need to calculate the effect size and calculate its average. But if the numbers can, are not comparable, they're comparing different things then it may not make sense, or sometimes it may be misleading to combine them. Okay. So in this case, we may just con want to conduct a systematic review without conducting a meta-analysis. Okay. But of course, this is a rare case. This is not common, because when we are doing a systematic review, we we'll also like to do a meta-analysis. There's also another case that we may just want to conduct a meta-analysis without systematic review. So the implication is our findings or our inputs can be biased. For example, uh, in social uh, psychology, we may need to conduct several studies. We may need to conduct study one, study two, study three, or even sometimes study four. And then uh, because uh, for some journals, they require multiple studies. And all of these four studies are not totally independent. They are similar, but there are some uh, modification or changes from study one to study two and study three and four. But after conducting four studies, researchers also like to combine these four studies together and see whether the effects are the same or similar. Then we can conduct mini meta-analysis here. Okay. So, but this is not, there's no systematic review because the studies are different.
these four studies are just based on your, your studies. You are not using some selection criteria to search the database systematically. Okay. So in this case, we, have, we used um, meta-analytic techniques to help us to synthesis the existing data without conducting a systematic review. So another question, or the first question, if you are going to conduct or you are planning to conduct meta-analysis, how many um, numbers do we need? So uh, can we conduct a report of meta-analysis with only two studies? No, 20, 40, 50. So are there any metric numbers? So that I think all of us know the simple answer is there's no single number that can be applied across different disciplines. Usually, um, it is a tricky question and it's hard to answer. And I'm usually using two guiding principles. The first one is, uh, of course, is related to the number of quest, uh, studies. If, uh, so for this case, it means whether there are enough studies. Because meta-analysis is the analysis of analysis. If there's no enough data, there's no point to conduct meta-analysis. Okay. So if we are using this uh, guiding principle, then we need to have a lot of studies. In other words, the field must be mature enough because if there's not enough studies, it means the, the field probably is quite new or they'll be quite diverging. Different researchers are using different methodology, they're doing different things and you can't combine and compare them. So uh, from these perspectives, we really need a lot of studies. Uh, depending on the journals, for example, uh, in social sciences, usually we are talking about 30 to 50 uh, for, for high impact journals like Psychological Bulletin, they are usually 50 to 100 something, sometimes 200. So it varies and usually uh, the more studies you have, then the more likely you can publish. This is one guiding principle. But on the other hand, um, there's another guiding principle question we should ask. How important or pressing the topic is? What I mean is, let's say, if you're doing a new topic, then in the literature there are just two or three studies. This is probably the case in medic medical research. When they're looking at the effectiveness of some new drugs, probably there are only two or three uh, randomized controlled trials. But from their perspectives, they also like to do a meta-analysis. The main reason is um, in order to recommend the drugs to the patients, to the participants, then they need to make a decision. Either you make a decision based on, let's say, three different studies, and then you internally look at them, use your brain to do the meta-analysis. For study one, it is effective. Study two is not effective. Study three is effective. So there are two studies are effective and one is not. So my conclusion is it is effective. If you do it this way, this was uh, what we call the narrative review or uh, the counting approach. And many researchers use it in the past because it's simple. You just count them and see whether they're effective or not. But it would be misleading. It would be not the best way to, do, to deal with the data. So. In this case, we have to make a decision anyway, because uh, touch wood, if something happens, then we need to decide whether to take this drug or not. Then the other approach is, even though there are only three studies, we conduct meta-analysis. By conducting a meta-analysis, we can summarize these three studies and come up with the best answer. So this is the best evidence. It may be wrong, but it will be the best recommendation based on these three studies. So in medical sciences, sometimes they conduct meta-analysis with only 10 studies or sometimes five studies because these are all the best uh, data available and then they need to make some recommendations. Okay. So if you don't rely on meta-analysis, then you have to go back to the old days and then make the recommendation based on individual studies and then you summarize all of these findings based on your brain, your head. Uh, I don't think uh, it will be better than uh, meta-analysis. Okay. So that's also a strong motive for them. But that said, uh, 
many of the research questions in social sciences are not that uh, life threatening. You, uh, men, uh, we, we don't need to, there's no critical point. You, you won't say, I have to make a decision, otherwise some, someone's life will be threatening. So from this perspective, it is quite difficult and not easy to justify uh, meta-analysis with only five studies, ten studies. You can't say, uh, this is new, no one has done before. Uh, so so I'm, I hope you, you can get some sense of why sometimes uh, it is not easy to decide. And the basic principle is um, I, whether the, uh, the findings can help us to make some uh, decision. If yes, then it will be useful. Otherwise, uh, in, we may want to wait more primary studies when the field is mature enough, when there are enough studies, then we can conduct a meta-analysis. Okay, so how about if we want to conduct a meta-analysis or even though um, we just want to read uh, published meta-analysis, the first thing we, we need to know is for all meta-analysis, we are using effect size as the unit or as the da data input. And effect size quantify uh, the effect of a treatment or drugs or intervention. So basically, um, we try to ensure that the effect size is what we call scale-free. For scale-free measure, it means um, whether you are using a nine point Laker scale one to nine or five point Laker scale or 10 points, the results are comparable because the, the key, the whole idea of meta-analysis is the effect sizes are comparable across studies and then we are going to average or do some uh, modeling on, the, on these effect sizes. So if the effect sizes are not comparable, then the meta-analysis will be misleading. So the first requirement is the so-called scale-free uh, scale measures. Luckily, uh, many of the statistics we are using are already scale-free measures, or they are already meta-analysis, for example, correlation. Okay. So in social sciences, we are measuring the correlation between two variables, and it is already scale-free. In other words, um, the range of the correlation is from negative one to positive one. So uh, if you are using a scaling point from 1 to 10, 1 to 20, the correlations are quite comparable. So this is a very good measure. The other one is uh, what we call mean difference. There are two types. One is standardized mean difference. The other is raw mean difference. So imagine if you are trying to use uh, uh, IQ scores. So suppose if the IQ scale is almost the same, it's already standardized, you're using standardized measure. So um, then it makes sense to use IQ scores as the, as the scale or the effect size. Now you can compare the treatment and the control group and then for the treatment group, we measure the change between the, the difference between the IQ. So you are implementing a new teaching method and then it turns out you help the students uh, Let's say it's very, very effective. You change five points in terms of IQ, IQ score. Okay. Since IQ score for this measure is comparable across different studies, they're using the same standardized measure, then we can simply use the raw mean difference as an effect size. The advantage is uh, it is easy to understand and it's easy to communicate to the readers. But for other measures, if we are talking about um, let's say, Lakey scale 1 to 5, 1 to 7, then we can't use the raw mean difference because uh, the difference uh, also depends on the scale. Then we standardize it, then we call this standardized mean difference. And now the meaning is slightly different because now the one unit in terms of the standardized mean difference means it is in terms of one standard deviation. Okay. And uh, in medicine, they basically use OX ratio so they don't use uh, correlation or standardized mean differences. So by the way, um, it's, uh, there are some, com some formulas to convert one form to the others, to convert correlation to standardized mean differences and to OX ratio. And usually we'll try to choose the, more, more, or the most natural scale. For example, if you're doing intervention, you have control group and intervention group, 
then we tend to use uh, mean difference. If we are using observational data, we are measuring the correlation between two variables, then it makes sense to use correlations. So we don't want to con convert them into something like ox ratio, which is difficult to interpret. And there are also other measures of effect sizes, but they are not suitable uh, for meta-analysis. For example, correlation uh, R squares. Uh, R squares is a useful and common effect size measure for multiple regression. Many of us are using it. Uh, we, we like it. But unfortunately, in the context of meta-analysis, it is not a good measure. So that's why we rarely see meta-analysis uh, use, use it. The main problem is for R squares, it cannot tell us the direction. When we are talking about the effectiveness, the index should tell us whether it's positive or negative. But for R squares, it combines all the variables together. So it's always from 0 to 1. So we know that, let's say, some variables are correlated with other variables, but we don't know the direction. That's why, in the context of observational data, we, we usually use correlation, cor but not the R, multiple R. Okay. And for effect size, usually it is uh, less sensitive to the sample size. In other words, if you have studies with very large sample size versus very small sample size, we expect the magnitude of the effect sizes are quite comparable. So this is a good thing. In other words, you, uh, you, even with more data, you don't expect your effect size will be getting bigger and bigger. So, so both of them are quite independent. And how about if the original studies don't report the effect size? Then too bad. We can't use it in the meta-analysis. Then there are two choices. The first option is to send an email to the author and friendly ask for the information, but it's quite unlikely that they are going to re reply to you. Then the second option is uh, you have to drop this case. So unfortunately, um, for meta-analysis, it's based on the summary of existing studies. So this is the, the major limitation. By the way, this is also the major strength because you don't need to rely on the the original authors, even though they are not willing to cooperate, as long as they have reported the standard uh, effect sizes like correlations and standardized mean differences, then you can do whatever you like. You can still continue to do the analysis and to check whether they find the original authors are the findings are quite uh, extreme. Okay, so now we move to a slightly more complicated content. In meta-analysis, um, there are two models. So, uh, although I'm not going to give any formulas, but uh, I'll show what are the differences between these two models. Um, the first one is um, fixed effects models. The second one is random effects models. And the major, uh, from a statistical point of view, the major difference is whether we assume the effect sizes of homogeneous. So this is one, uh, one approach. Okay. And, but uh, the conceptual implication is uh, based on different models, our interpretations or generalization would be quite different. Okay, so we'll look at them one by one. So first of all, we look at the first uh, fixed effects models. Um, for fixed effects model, the basic assumptions is our studies are direct replicates of each other. So probably you, you have heard of, about some what we call uh, replicability issues or reproducibility issues. There are lots of research and debates, and some researchers arguing, especially in psychology, most of the published findings cannot be replicate, replicated. So um, what they are referring to is uh, for the original study, it was it is significant, but for the rapid case studies, it is not. So by the way, this is not the correct or the best way to look at these issues because later when we look at the random effects model, then you see uh, usually we, it is not reasonable to expect the effect size would be identical or homogeneous. Okay. But for the fixed effects models, usually we have this kind of assumption because we assume the studies are direct replicates. What it means is, let's say um, 
your friend, your colleague has just conducted uh, study one. And then now, based on his or her protocol, you replicate, you collect new data, and try to, re to see whether you can come up with the same findings. And then another friend, enough, and try to replicate. So now you have three studies. But you can see the protocols are identical. So this is a direct replic replication. Okay. So when we are using a fixed effects models, we usually assume the studies are just direct replicates of each other's. And uh, based on these assumptions, then the generalization are quite limited to this set of studies because they're using the same protocols. So how about if the protocols or samples are different? Then the results can be different. Then this is the major limitation of a fixed effects models. Our generalization can only be applied to this particular set of studies. Okay. So let's look at another or in to contrast with other models, random effects models. So for these models, we assume there's a larger uh, potential population. So let's imagine in the whole world, there are lots of studies on the effectiveness of this treatment. Then for some reasons, we have sampled or conducted five studies, 10 studies. But this is just five out of this very big pool of studies. In this pool, there are infinity studies. Okay, so it just happened that we have collected and observed five. Okay. What is the implication? The main implication is even though we have only observed five, we are able to generalize to this potential population, just like what we are doing in statistics. When we are doing in sampling, uh, we are collecting 20, 30 participants, but we try to generalize to the whole population. The same, same idea applies here. In contrast, when you compare to a fixed effects model, for fixed effects model, we assume they are all identical. Study one is identical to study two, study three, study four. But under the random effects models, we don't assume, don't need to assume they are identical. They can be different in slightly uh, various way. For example, in study one, they are based on uh, Chinese samples. In study two, it's based on uh, US or American samples. In study three, you are using questionnaire A. In uh, study four, you are using questionnaire, uh, questionnaire B. And there are, we allow different, the, we allow the studies are slightly different from each other. As long as they are addressing the same research question, the same population, then we are fine with it. Okay. So um, this is more flexible. But of course, as you can see, if we allow the studies to be slightly different from each other, we don't expect the effect sizes will be identical. This is the main reasons why we must allow heterogeneity. So under the random effects models, we allow the studies are slightly different from each other. So in this case, we are estimating the mean and its variance. In contrast, for fixed effects models, since we are uh, assume they are all direct replicates, there's only one effect size. All of these are identical. So there's no heterogeneity. There's only one single mean. Okay. Okay, so um, in the more technical terms, uh, uh, the variance of the two effect size can be estimated, which is the heterogeneity. Okay, so let's look at uh, two figures. Okay. So uh, by the way, I've mentioned there's no formula, but I didn't say there's no figures. Okay. So here, this is the fixed uh, effects model. This uh, line represents what we call the common effects. So let's imagine there are five studies that direct replicate each, with each other. And uh, let's say this is your, you have conducted study one, your friends have conducted study two to study five. So all of them are from the same samples. So you expect the effects are exactly the same, just one point. Okay. But we don't expect the observed effect sizes will be identical because uh, our sample sizes are quite small. For study one is based on 20, study two is based on 30. So now we expect there's a curve due to sampling error. So these are uh, Y1 and Y2 are the observed effects okay, because of sampling error. 
because you you don't have the research money to recruit uh, ten thousand subjects. Let's imagine if you have ten thousand subjects in each studies, then all of these would only be one pond. They become smaller and smaller because you have more subjects. Then the same the distribution becomes smaller and smaller. Okay, so this I this idea is uh, the whole idea of fixed effects model. But in contrast, for random effects model, this uh, ye yellow area. For the yellow area, it includes the, all the potential effects. Okay. We don't need to assume they are identical. Okay. So in this case, we have to estimate the mean and its variance. And then the sample effects also vary because, again, the sam sampling distribution. So in other words, we expect the effects would be much big, uh, vary a lot. Under the fixed effects model, uh, so under the fixed effects model, the variation would be smaller. Under the random effects models, the variation would be larger. Because for the random effects model, it includes two types of ran randomness. The first one is due to sampling error. Sampling error basically is the, due to the number of subjects. If you have more money, or all the researchers have more money, they can recruit 10,000 subjects per study, then there's no sampling error at all. But the other one is the true variation. So for this part, there's nothing we can do. Even you have lots of money, even you collect 10,000 subjects per studies, you can't help because each study has its own uh, effects. That's why we expect the effects will be different. Okay. So um, in the past, many researchers used the fixed effects model because uh, for when applying the fixed effects model, um, the standard error is smaller, usually. And when we're applying the random effects model, the standard error would be bigger, slightly bigger. So the implication is when we are using the fixed effects model, the findings are more likely to be statistically significant. So now you wonder why in the past, most re many researchers like to use fixed effects model regardless of whether it's correct or not. Because many of these, the average, the findings will be statistically significant. But when we switch it to random effects models, many of these effects disappear because now we'll take care of this heterogeneity. Okay. But uh, nowadays, uh, we can't do it because random effects models is the standard model. So if you are going to use the fixed effects models, the reviewers, the editors will ask you why you are using the fixed effects model. Then it did. By the way, in some cases, it is correct to use fixed effects model. As I mentioned, if this is a direct rapid case, you have four students working together on four different, pro four different groups of samples, and then you are using the same protocols, then you expect them to be identical. Then the fixed effects model is the best model, the correct model. But if you are using different measures, different designs, different population samples, you don't expect the effects would be identical. And from a statistical point of view, how about if these random effects, the variance becomes smaller and smaller? Then probably you notice, then it becomes the fixed effects model. So these two models, in f the fixed effects model, in fact, is a special case. We call it a special case of random effects model when the heterogeneity becomes zero. Okay. So that's why usually we start with the random effects model. If your data are really homogeneous, automatically it becomes the fixed effects model. But if you start with the fixed effects model and it turns out your data are not, then you draw an incorrect conclusion. Okay, so when there are lots of heterogeneity, what we call excessive heterogeneity, then we would like to model it or try to explain it. It's quite logical for us. And usually what we do is try to include some moderators. And uh, unfortunately, in, um, in meta-analysis, there are quite limited room for us what we can do. Because meta-analysis is based on published uh, findings. 
if the original authors didn't report, uh, let's say, the mean of the participants, the composition of the gender, then we, we can't include these variables. And usually, what we can do is to include some um, what we call demographics, like the mean of the participants, the age, the, education, the mean educational level. There's not much we can do. And recently, uh, researchers have started to use cultural values. So uh, assuming that the participant from, let's say, US or uh, Hong Kong, they share their own cultural values, then we can extract the individualism, collectivism, and use them as moderators. But uh, you can see for the whole process, uh, it all did, uh, limited by the data availability. And there's still lots of rooms how to improve the, the potential moderators. So it's not a stati the main issue is not a statistical issue. It's mainly, uh, first of all, most researchers do not have theories to explain why some studies have larger effects than others. So they use because most of us are working on subject levels. When we are doing research, we know the subjects. So we may hypothesize subject level data, but not the study levels. So for the study level, usually uh, from sociology, they may be more familiar than psychologists. For, for us, psych when we are doing psychology, we usually look at the individual levels. But for um, explanation for the differences across studies, we need macro levels. We need studies levels. Okay. And another issue is uh, we need to be careful when we are doing interpretation because uh, if I use a multi-level perspective, then this is what we call level two, the study levels. But at the same time, we are interested in the individual levels. So let's use an example for some, if we've used uh, the uh, mean age of the participant as a moderator, and it turns out that the, f the findings is more effective for uh, older, older participants. Okay? Because when we put the mean age of the participant, it is statistically significant in predicting the effect size. So some of us may incorrectly jump to the conclusion that it is more effective for let's say, uh, older participants. But this is not correct, because uh, what we, the findings or the data analysis have shown us is uh, for the studies with more older participants, it is more effective. So the unit of analysis or interpretation is the studies. It is correct to say that uh, if in your studies, if you have more older participants, it is more effective. But it is slightly different from it is more effective for older participants. For older participants, it is the individual level referring to us at this level. But the findings have only tell us that it is effective for studies with more older participants. Okay. So it is a little bit tricky. We call this ecological fallacy, meaning that uh, our findings are at level two, but we overgeneralize it to level one. So this is not correct because even though it is more effective for studies with older participants, it may not be effective for older, older participants. It is totally different. Okay. So this is other case that we, we may likely make incorrect uh, interpretation. So in the remaining time, I'm going to use a quick example. So I'm, I'm not going to focus on the content, but just give you an idea uh, what type of uh, tip, what is a typical meta analysis? What type of uh, uh, approach that we can use? So in this meta analysis, uh, my colleagues are uh, Professor Cecilia Zhang at uh, University of Hong Kong, and then we work at uh, relationship of health locus of control. So basically, the effect size is the correlation between different dimension of uh, HLOC health locus of control and with other variables. So basically it's the correlation. Okay. So the first step is to conduct a systematic review. So um, like in here, we start with about 3,000, so probably too small, but uh, just repeat. Uh, after adding some extra search, then it, 
uh, there were a total of 3,150 something of articles. So the first step is to screen these articles. Usually we look at the abstracts. We don't go into the details. Based on the abstracts, then we need to decide whether it is likely to be useful or not. So this is the first cut. Okay. So then uh, we drop about two thousand. In, in fact, he did all, all of this. He, he, she, sorry, she, she did all of this uh, heavy work. She dropped about two thousand. So it turns out there were only one thousand. Okay. And then for this one thousand, uh, we have to go through and download the full text and see whether they are relevant. And after that, there's about 144. Okay, so this process is quite typical in terms of percentage. You come, you, you uh, begins with 3,000 something in, in based on the abstract. And then after reading the abstract, we drop about two, two thirds. And then based on this 1,000, uh, we only have um, slightly more than I think, I think about 15% are useful. So it's, uh, it's quite painful in, in terms of process because you are looking about several thousand and come up with several, uh, 100 or something. Okay. And that's why many of uh, my, my collaborators, when they're doing meta-analysis, they are doing, or they, when they're doing the searching, they're doing more than one topic. So it means it looks like a factory. So they search, when they're searching the data, then the database can be used in multiple uh, meta-analysis. So uh, they can change the dependent variable from one variable to another, then there's another paper. So um, if you're starting and focusing on just one paper, then the whole process is very painful. And then after running all of this analysis, we, we can come up with something like this table with the correlation and also indicate the average effects like uh, these are the average effect and its Compton interval and also the heterogeneity. Okay, so this includes um, more information than necessary. Then this is for the first set and also for the second set. Okay, but uh, just get a general idea. If you look at these two set of uh, tables, you find that usually the co uh, average effect is about 0.1 or less than 0.2. So this is quite typical in social sciences. So you don't expect uh, you observe a 0 0.7, 0 0.6 correlation in, in meta-analysis because many of the constructs are quite weak in, in social sciences. Uh, so we are working with this. Uh, if you have 0.2, 0.3, then it's quite OK in terms. But the main advantage of doing meta-analysis usually is it doesn't matter whether there's significant or with strong or weak correlation. Because what we are doing is trying to summarize the existing literature. Uh, if it turns out that in the existing literature is about 0.1, then it's fine. No one will complain and say that your correlation is very low. Uh, so this is the existing literature. Okay. So usually, for if you have correctly following the procedure and if your topic is uh, interesting, then uh, the findings whether they are positive or negative, usually they, they won't have a, a huge impact on, on your paper. So that's the, but if you're doing a primary study, then you may need to concern if your findings are, uh, let's say the correlations are very weak, uh, because the main problem in primary studies is there are many ways that makes your findings not po uh, significant. For example, you can use a very lousy measure. All of them are just based on noise. So the correlation can be very, very low. Okay. But in the context of meta-analysis, all of these are published findings. So if they're all with a uh, low correlation, then usually uh, reviewers or editors may not question it. And uh, in these examples, we also use uh, gender de decomposition, mean, meaning that the proportion of females, age, composition, and we also included two cultural dimensions like uh, individualism and power distance to predict the effect sizes. Okay, okay so um, now we move to the last part. It looks like uh, meta-analysis is very promising, it's a very useful tool. It is, but there are also some limitations just like uh, all other techniques. Um, one of them is combining 
apples and oranges and it, this was uh, the old argument in I think when when meta-analysis was, was first proposed there are many researchers complained that um, they were combining oranges and apples okay. so uh, by the way nowadays uh, we, we rarely um, find this as a very strong argument because just imagine if you are not doing meta-analysis you are just doing a literature review when you com comprehend or compare different studies you are also comparing and combining them internally using your brain okay. so, uh, so it also, you are trying to combine synthesis everything as, so, that, uh, we, so we are also doing the same thing even though we are not using meta-analysis but if you are using your own way to combine the findings it could be lead to bias because you like study one but not study the other studies we have selection bias but when we use meta-analysis it provides a very clear way and then uh, and, and everyone can follow what you, we are doing okay. and the, the argument the other argument is um, or another possible solution as listed here is uh, we can consider all of this as moderators okay. so what I mean is we, are com we can include and estimate what's the effect of oranges what's the effects of apples so we can include all of the differences as research uh, moderators or design moderators like uh, different types of intervention treatment and then we can we can, we can still still combine them, but at the same time we can also honor their differences. Another limitation or issue is publication bias. Uh, probably all of us, when we are doing research, will recognize that um, the published uh, studies they are not a good representative, or at least is only partially represent all the effects because of the publication bias there are different levels uh, that may lead to this publication bias for example uh, as authors uh, after conducting uh, studies if the findings are not good uh, then you may not would want to spend time because you know it is quite hard to publish it then you put them away and so you may only work on the studies if they are statistically significant or with strong effects at the review process, then reviewer may question if your findings are not significant, they're not strong. Okay. So by the way, one concern about the so-called not significant findings basically is uh, if your measures are very bad, then you can lead to just random noise. So in other words, your findings, uh, non-significant findings can be interpreted as two ways. One is there's no difference at the population, they are, they are the same or your, your measures are not good enough just measurement error, noise so that's why they are not significant so that's why reviewers or editors sometimes are quite concerned about non-significant findings so this also leads to publication bias because it's more likely uh, when the findings are significant they're more likely to be published and it's also known as file draws problem okay. uh, but is it a problem of meta-analysis? I don't think so. It's a matter of how we are doing science or publication. So even though when we don't use meta-analysis, the findings are still biased. Okay. So when we look at the literature, when we read the literature, we are also reading at the biased proportion. When we find that, well, all the published findings are useful, they are all significant. When we make this conclusion, it's also based on the biased finding. Okay. But for meta-analysis, there are lots of techniques trying to address this question. So for example, we can use funnel pot, we, can, we may include unpublished work, and we can also test whether the, the effect sizes are biased. One typical example is this uh, funnel pot. So, so for funnel pot, uh, the y-axis is standard error. Uh, is usually in related to the sample size. In other words, you can just consider at this end, the sample sizes are smaller. At this end, the sample sizes of the studies are much larger. Okay. And then 
on this axis is the effect size. So this is similar to a fixed effect model. Imagine if you have uh, studies with very, very big sample sizes, several thousands, then all of them will be merged at this point because there's no sampling error. But when you have studies with only 10 or 5 subjects, this is the effect, but because of the small sample sizes, it can be very big or very small. So ideally, if there's no publication bias, then we may expect the effect sizes would be centered around these areas. Okay. So uh, this is for fixed effects model. For random effects model, uh, we may expect at this end, it, they won't merge to a single point. Because even at the population level, even you have thousands or lots of sample sizes, there are still some variation. Okay. Now, when we look at the publication bias, we are looking at this end and that end. So for this end, they, they have very strong effect. But for this end, they have very weak effect. So when there are publication bias, we expect there are studies here, but not in this area. Because in this part, they will be rejected. They are just non-significant with 20, 30 subjects. But on the other side, they are, they are only based on 20, 30 subjects, but they are significant. So that's why they are accepted. Okay. And, but the reality is uh, it's more messy than our theory. That's why, for some of this is uh, based on real data. It's hard to, t it, there's no clear picture whether there's publication bias because there's some study here, but not there, but on the other side. Okay. But, uh, but it also gives us, uh, if you have enough studies, let's say uh, 50, 100 or something, then they will usually tell us uh, whether there's some sign of publication bias. Okay. Okay, so to conclude, um, for systematic review and meta-analysis, they provide very useful tools for us, not only in uh, medicine, but also in social sciences, uh, behavioral sciences. So nowadays, uh, they're very powerful tools. And by the way, the good news is uh, all of these techniques, in terms of the statistical model, they are the same. In other words, uh, if you know how to conduct meta-analysis in psychology, social sciences, the techniques can be transferred to medicine or other areas. Even though there will be slightly uh, differences in, dif in different disciplines, but the statistical models are almost identical. So it's quite good uh, for the students if they have learned how to conduct meta-analysis in one area. When they move to another area, then they can apply similar techniques, similar softwares. The main difference is the effect size. In social sciences, we are using correlation coefficients, standardized mean difference, but in medicine, they are using ox ratios. But the models are identical, and the techniques are the same. Okay. But uh, I think we also need to recognize the potential limitations of meta-analysis and more generally, uh, research publications. So um, that's why we don't expect the findings published in uh, the literature, they are, they are representing everything. There's some sort of publication bias there. That's why uh, when uh, we, we usually recommend to include some unpublished work, especially dissertations, and then to see whether there are clear patterns between t these two sets of studies. Okay, so um, I hope you, you, you get basic ideas of what meta-analysis is, and I welcome your comments and questions.